मैम यू आर ऑन म्यूट thank you okay uh, welcome back to class before we went for our break we were looking at uh, the how of incarnation and we looked at philippians chapter 2 we saw a few verses there and the seven steps of incarnation um so can somebody tell me what are you know when when jesus became man he was 100% god 100% man but can somebody tell me of or uh, each one can say one aspect one aspect of what you know are the limitations he took on you know uh, when he became fully man he was fully god he was fully man when he lived here on the earth but what are uh, the limitations what aspects did he limit himself to or he did not take upon himself when he became man he was not omnipotent omniscient omnipresent okay so thank you john um, you know he gave up um, or ceased to use his um, uh, you know his eternal nature of being uh, omnipotent omnipresent and omniscient can somebody else tell me another aspect that jesus gave up when he became man another aspect of his divine nature that he gave up when he became man he, he made himself of no repetition okay so what do you okay, mean so by that okay so what do you mean by that that is is empty himself of being equal with god Okay. okay thank you thank you can you please mute your please mic mute your mic yeah thank you so we see that uh, you know he did not consider being equal with god his equality with god he gave up his position of being equal with god and hence uh, he gave up his right of being worshiped or being honored as god okay anything else he gave up another important thing i've been explaining about that one we saw was the nature his um, his eternal nature of being omnipotent omnipresent omniscient uh, he gave up his position of being equal with god the father and another important thing what is doxa the greek word doxa when translated in english he operated in sonship glory doxa means glory okay thank you john so he gave up his uh, the glory of being god um because um and he took on the glory of uh, man that is the sonship glory Uh, did he get back his um, his divine glory when he went back to heaven yes he did yes he did how do we know that philippians 28 philippians 28 okay and john chapter 17 as well i've been talking about the high priestly prayer of jesus okay um why did he give up his um, his eternal glory why did he uh, take on sonship glory why didn't he dwell in his eternal glory when he lived here i just explained that some time back it's very important i've explained it couple of times as well why did he give up his uh, the glory of being uh, god his divine glory
Come on, class, explain that quite a bit. Uh, because he chose to do that to fulfill the purpose of God on earth. Thank you, Silatoli. He chose to do that. Okay. Yes, he chose to do it, but why did he choose to do it? Yes, go ahead, Lubega. I think basically to save mankind, to save you, me, and all others in the, in the class. <laughs> okay, uh, how to save us? Through dying a humiliation, death on the cross. Okay. Now, if he came in his divine glory, you know, what would have happened? Would we be able to see him, touch him, experience him, walk with him, talk to him? No. Yeah, of course, we could talk to him. But we can't see him, we can't touch him because why? Go ahead, Lubega. I think it would be impossible for them to touch him without his choice. Because we see that even when they were go when they were going, when Judas Iscariot had betrayed him, these people did not know he was. That's why they chose to he, they chose a sign of kissing him or hugging him. And we say, there is where we read in the Bible extra biblical context where himself when he said come and arrest me they would all fall off so you see it wasn't possible if he had not given himself in and said now you can come and take me over okay thank you i think we should do a question answer round a more of reflective question so that you know i'm able to able to understand or uh, even know whether you have gathered all uh, the truths and the information right because this is so important um, well, I said that, you know, uh, in his divine nature, God, uh, his divine uh, glory, uh, you know, he lives in unapproachable light that no man has seen or can see. And I uh, quoted this from First Timothy chapter 6, verse 16. So if Jesus had come down as man, then there would be no use absolutely for us. We wouldn't have been able to see him, touch him, or even to for him to reveal the nature of God, for us to know the nature of God, because he lives in unapproachable light in the glory of his, you know, of him being God. Okay, and we can't see him. So he gave up the glory of being God, his divine glory, and that's why he took on his sonship glory. Okay, so this is very, very important. And who did he give his sonship glory to? Who did he give his sonship glory to? To each one of us. To each one of us. Where do we know, uh, read about this? Where, where does he ask his father to give back his glory of being God? Where John chapter 17. Okay, thank you. John chapter 17. So like you all to, uh, you know, uh, even as we're doing a quick uh, uh, quiz about what we have studied, it's good to follow through, make notes, uh, all of these important um, points. Okay. Uh, so why did God, uh, why did Jesus become incarnate? Why did Jesus become incarnate? Come on, it's very simple. Why did Jesus become incarnate? Why did he become man? What was the primary reason? Yes, go ahead, Lubega. I think he was to save human beings. He came here to remove the sin that was put here by Adam and Eve and to take back to the kingdom of God. Okay, thank you. Uh, that was one of the reasons. But the other reason, what was the other reason? To give us back a relationship with the Lord, with yes, God. Thank Thank you. That was the primary reason also to, you know, uh, you know, um, 
join back our relationship with God, reconcile mankind back to God, because that's the very reason that God created us. The very reason he created Adam and Eve is so that he could fellowship with us, to have a relationship, and that relationship was broken because of sin. And so we see that uh, God becoming man was so that people could really understand the heart of God. Okay, not misunderstand, but understand the true heart and the true nature of God. Yes, go ahead, Libega. To fulfill the prophecy in, in, in Genesis 3, where the Bible, where God told the Satan through in the snake form that uh, the, the son of man or the son of that woman will come and crush your head. It was to fulfill the prophecies of the old the OT. Okay, thank you. The seed of the woman, thank you. Yes. So we see that, you know, basically it was to get back in our relationship with God, uh, for us, for him to manifest or reveal the true nature of God and also to die on the, uh, the cross for our um, sins. Okay. Now we look at God manifested in the flesh. Uh, please turn to First Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, please. Can all of you turn to First Timothy chapter 3, verse 16? And what can somebody who's not read so far, can you read First Timothy chapter 3, verse 16? I can go. Yeah. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. Thank you, Joy. So in First Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, we see a revelation of the mystery of uh, godliness. Now, this phrase, without controversy, means without any questions or without dispute or beyond any questions. And uh, if you look at in the literal translations and the manuscripts, the original manuscripts, the word God is not there. So it reads as the mystery of godliness who was manifested in the flesh. And now we know what's the meaning of mystery. It is something that is uh, hidden. Okay, but this mystery that is hidden about who God is, the revelation of God, you know, has now been known, has now been manifested. It was once hidden, but it's now manifested. It's uh, made known to us. Okay, so therefore, First Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 is teaching us about the incarnation. Uh, God, who, was, uh, who previously existed, um, he was before time, before all time, but uh, was uh, unknown to the world. But, uh, you know, in a certain uh, point in time, certain place uh, in the and in a certain uh, period in history, you know, God manifested himself and made himself known uh, to mankind. OK, so that is uh, the meaning of God manifested in the flesh. God with us. Matthew chapter one, verse 23. Can somebody read that, please? Matthew chapter 1 verse 23. Matthew chapter 1 verses 23. Behold, the virgin shall be the child, shall be with the child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Yes, thank you. So we see that incarnation, uh, Emmanuel, that is God with us, uh, you know, someone we could see in a very real, close way, experience. He was somebody who was God, but was with um, man. Okay. So from this lesson, uh, what do we basically gather is God revealed himself uh, in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, since God is unchangeable, we learned about this attribute of God and we looked at it in Matthew, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Uh, we see that Christ is the full and complete revelation of God and therefore there is no more need for any more revelation of God. He is more than sufficient, more than um, enough. So that we don't need uh, you know, one more revelation of God. We see that in the incarnation, God uh, came to be with man. He dwelt with man. He tabernacled with man. Um, and when he became man, he did not cease to become God. He was fully God. He was fully man. He was 100% God, 100% man, truly God, truly man, all God and all man. 
okay so the incarnation is not about a man becoming a god okay like we have so called god man you know uh, uh this term that we use for men on earth who are like saints who are gurus you know we call them as god men uh, or god man and uh, he's not somebody who was man and became god but he was god who became man um and uh, when we say that he was not a man who became god we are not talking about him having some mystical experiences or some divine enlightenment like others had but this is totally different he is he is god uh, and he became man okay so in the incarnation god became man in totality uh, he took on the fullness of human uh, of human kind of human beings he was fully man he had a spirit soul and body and his humanity was real and total okay so the next chapter we'll look at we'll study about the humanity of christ before we look at chapter 6 the humanity of christ anyone has any questions this lesson i would uh, humbly request you know each one of you please take time to go through chapter 5 okay it is very very important uh, for uh, our understanding about how uh, jesus was fully god and fully man when he lived on this earth what were his uh, you know uh, what did he limit himself to what did he not take upon himself what did he take upon himself also as well is very important for you to know these are foundational truths and uh, if you need to know it for yourself you need to read it and if you have to explain it to others and teach it to others you have to read it as well so please request you humbly to please take time uh, to read chapter 5 okay if there are no questions no comments uh, can we move on to chapter 6 please yes no no response yes ma'am we can move to the next chapter okay i thought chapter 5 was too heavy for all of you anyway we'll move on to chapter 6 uh, in this chapter we are going to look at a close uh, glimpse of the humanity of christ um we we know that uh, and we will discover as well that he was human in all aspects in all areas um and we'll also look at the fact that he willingly um restricted himself or gave himself up to the frailties the limitations of um, uh, mankind uh, and is was in every way a human being just like you and i except in one area can you tell me which area i repeat my question i said that in every area he was he uh, was just like you and i just like any other human being except in one area which was that sin yes to thank you except in the area of uh, being sinless he was um, not sinful like each one of us and that is why we see that he was not even born in sin he was born to a virgin um, okay and who was not married uh who had not known any man he was totally sinless he lived a sinless life and um and you know that uh there was one aspect uh, that he did not have of us being human beings but in every other way in weakness frailties every other way he was human just like you and i and this is something that we need to grasp this is something very important that we need to grasp about the incarnation that he was like us in every way except without um sin okay now why was it necessary for jesus to become a human uh, just a few uh, reasons that we could summarize important reasons is um you know christ humanity uh, uh if he was he had not become human he could not reveal god the father uh to us and we could not fully understand the father heart of god the attributes the nature of god okay and we also see that uh, the humanity of christ uh, provided the basis for um, you know um, though uh, for identifying with 
mankind. Okay, so also for God to identify uh, with mankind and for his substitutionary work being substitute on our behalf so that he can be uh, the full sufficient perfect sacrifice uh, for our sins. He can make it for our sins and also be the perfect mediator for mankind okay and through his humanity christ was also able to set us an example now how did he set us an example when god became man when jesus became man he set us an example in which areas did he set us an example holiness how to walk worthy Okay, it's uh, holiness, how to walk worthy, because we saw that the standard in the Old Testament and the New, uh, New Testament that God requires of us is just one, the same standard, be holy as I am holy. That's what God says. Thank you, John. Go ahead, Joy. I was going to say the same. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? How else did he set as an example? Yes, he was obedient. Remember, uh, remember I said he willingly uh, submitted and surrendered to the Father, even though he was God, fully God, when he lived here on this earth. He willingly uh, surrendered. He was obedient to the Father. He aligned his will to the Father's will. Okay, so that's so important. Uh, for us to notice and so he set as an example in the area of obedience uh, in the area of aligning our will to God's will okay what else did he set as an example in yes go ahead Siddhikinu ma'am hum humbleness by washing the feet of his disciples okay humility um, you know he um, gave up his uh, glory he gave up his position, his right to being worshipped as God, and he humbled himself as a servant. Thank you. Lubega? Did I see your hand up, Lubega? No, Pastor. Okay, sorry. Okay. Anyone else? He also set us an example that in the sonship glory that he had, that he lived in, uh, he was able to manifest the Father. Uh, that means he was able to manifest who God is and what he does. And when he has given us the same sonship glory, we too can manifest uh, who God is and what uh, he does. So we can manifest who God is through the fruit of the Spirit. Of course, it is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we can manifest what God does through the works uh, or the gifts of the Spirit. Okay, the nine gifts of the spirit. So uh, Jesus, when he did the miracles, he did it not in his, um, we look at that not in his uh, divine nature, but in him being totally human uh, through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. We also have been given the same empowering of the Holy Spirit. So that's why Jesus said, you can do much more than I have done. You can do greater miracles than I have done because I'm going to the Father. That means we too can do the same miracles that Jesus has uh, done. Okay, so he said as an example in all of these areas. Okay. So um, through what Jesus did for us, you know, for what he did for us as human beings, we have the privilege of being his sons and daughters, being part of his family. Uh, and we are also able to understand, uh, you know, how we can live uh, and how he lived and how he did uh, things on this earth. So we too can imitate him. He too, and he too is our role model that we can follow. Okay, so we look at some aspects of uh, his humanity, um, of him being 100% uh, human being. He was born of a woman. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 tells us that. Can somebody read that, please? Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a, wom born of a woman, born under the law. Thank you. So here we see the first step of him becoming human. He was born of a woman. 
um, you know, we are all born of a woman and uh, it describes our human origin. It also, um, you know, describes and shows that uh, our weaknesses and our frailties. Um, so imagine the son of God, you know, limiting himself and subjecting himself to the whole uh, psychological or physiological process of uh, development within the womb, uh, the process of childbirth, uh, infancy and growth. And so we see that he limited himself to even the, the physiological uh, process of development. So we you know, if he wanted to become man, he could just come down as a full grown man, okay, and just do his three years of ministry and go. But he limited himself in, 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 uh, to the very point of, um, you know, the whole process of development of being within the womb, uh, you know, the process of childbirth, infancy, and growth his um, his humanity can also be seen uh, you know that the, when we read in luke chapter 2 verse 40 that he grew up like a child uh, intellectually um, you know luke chapter 2 verse 52 we see that he increased in wisdom uh, uh, one John chapter four was seven and was uh, chapter nineteen was twenty eight says he thirsted. Luke four two and Matthew twenty one was eighteen says he was hungry. He hungered. Uh, he felt pain. Hebrews five eight. Um, he also expressed compassion. We see you know uh, before he did a lot of miracles. Uh, we see this phrase used again and again. He was moved with. Uh, compassion. He expressed joy. Uh, John chapter 15 verse 11. Uh, he also expressed anger, you know, when he was angry with um, uh, the the way uh, uh, the Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, uh, priests thought uh, in their minds, their attitudes. Uh, he was also angry with how they had uh, made the, his father's house. Okay, so he expressed anger. He expressed sorrow. Matthew chapter 26 uh, 37 to 30 and 38, you know, he was sorrowful to the point of death in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was also lonely, uh, Matthew chapter 27, verse 38. And we see in Matthew chapter 4, verse 11, he was tempted just like you and I uh, were tempted. So we see that he was um, fully man. Uh, he went he uh, had all the frailties, weaknesses, all the limitations that you and I have as human beings. Okay, as a human being, we see that uh, you know he came in the descent of uh, David. Romans chapter one verse three says concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. So we see he has a natural lineage that he was identified to. Um, Romans chapter 9 verses 4 and 5. Can somebody read that please? Romans chapter 9 verses 4 and 5. Somebody who's not read can read Romans chapter 9 verses 4 and 5. Okay, can somebody just read that? Anyone? Who is Pilate? To whom belongs adoption as sins, and the glory and the covenants, and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises? Whose are the fathers, and from whom is Christ according to the flesh, who is overall? God bless it forever. Amen. Okay, thank you. In um, Romans, um, you know, the letter to the uh, church at Rome, Paul is basically writing to the Jews and also to the Gentiles, and he's talking about um, how the Jews, you know, they um, uh, they forsook the the law, the the gospel, and so it was given to the Gentiles. Um, and he says, you know, you know, the Israelites, they are. Uh, uh, they are proud of their heritage because they have, uh, you know, the covenants, the laws, uh, the forefathers uh, who God spoke to, um, the prophets. Um, and then he goes on to say that, you know, in this 
great lineage or heritage, you know, came Jesus Christ, who is overall uh, eternally blessed God. So we see that um, he was not only from the seed of David, in his natural uh, lineage, but he also had the natural lineage of being a Jew, uh, of being of uh, the nation of Israel. Okay. Um, in John 1 John chapter 1 verses 1 uh, to 3 talks about we have heard him we have seen and um, and our hands have handled okay so that means people have had personal relationship uh, with this uh, God incarnate who they have heard they have seen and they have handled can somebody read 1 John chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 First John chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the world of life the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the father and was manifested to us that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you. So here uh, the Apostle is testifying or giving his personal testimony about his relationship with the incarnate Son of God. And he's saying this is, uh, you know, Jesus was one who they have heard, they have seen, they have and uh, who was touched by various people. So his humanity was real. He was truly flesh and blood. And this is whom they are writing about. This is whom they are revealing. This is whom they are preaching about. Okay. The next one is that, uh, you know, this uh, God who is incarnate, the eternal Logos, uh, who became flesh, uh, is our mediator. Okay, First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Can somebody read that, please? For there is one. Okay, thank you. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Okay, so here we look at uh, the mediatory role of... Um, uh, the man that is talking about Jesus Christ. Okay, so we see as a mediator, uh, uh, you know, as um, as being fully God and fully man uh, when he was on this earth. He was a true representative of um, uh, the human race to the Father. He represented the human race to the Father. He also was somebody, you know, who revealed. Uh, or the exact representation of the Father. So he revealed uh, the Father uh, to us. And hence, we see as a mediator, he actually, uh, you know, built um, uh, the bridges or the gap between God and man that was caused because of um, uh, sin. Uh, as um, as you, mankind, we were not able to reach out to God. Um, it was because of our sinfulness, our sinly estate that we were in, slaves of sin, slave of the devil. Um, and, you know, in our frailties, we could not reach up to him. But it was uh, because of what Jesus did on the cross, you know, that uh, we could, we have direct access to the Father. Yes, people in the Old Testament had access to God, but they had to go through the priests. They had to go through, um, you know, the, uh, the judges or uh, the prophets or the leaders whom uh, God had chosen. And um, we see that when Jesus died on the cross, the curtain of the temple that separates uh, the courts uh, and the uh, most holy of holies was torn into two, which says that, you know, we all have access to the most holy place, that we have access to God the Father. So as a mediator, he reconciled us back to God. He was a true representative of mankind to God. He also was a true representative of God uh, 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 to mankind and also was somebody who, you know, um, who was able to build the uh, bridges, the gaps that we can personally, um, you know, approach God. We can go before the throne of grace and receive grace and mercy to help us in the time of need. Okay, so by becoming incarnate, God was reaching down to man in Christ Jesus. Um, and uh, man was uh, also reaching back uh, to God through Jesus 
Christ. Okay, so through Jesus Christ, God and men were reconciled uh, to each other. We were reconciled through the man Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ was also a man approved by God. Acts chapter two, verse twenty-two. Can somebody read that, please? Acts chapter two, verse twenty-two. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man arrested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself also know. Okay, thank you. So this is uh, Peter when he was addressing the crowd just right after uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And um, he reveals an important truth about the humanity of Christ. Uh, he says here that, um, that the miracles uh, that Jesus did uh, is linked to his humanity and not him being deity or not him being uh, God. Okay, it says here that um, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through you in your midst as you yourself know. Okay, so the mighty miracles that Jesus did very important to note here. Please listen. The mighty miracles that Jesus did, or not only the mighty, the, even if you th think about the simple miracles, uh, whatever, all of the miracles, you know, he, he did it as being man, being human, and uh, being within the limitations of his um, humanity. Okay, so Jesus did all the signs, miracles, and wonders by him being man. Okay, um, and we see that uh, Jesus himself never attributes uh, his miracle working power or the miracles he's uh, done to him being deity. Uh, at the very beginning of his ministry, he declares in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, he says, uh, The Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit was upon him because God has anointed him. Okay, even after his temptation, we see that he. Um, you know, he went to Galilee with full of the uh, spirit. Okay, so we see that um, uh, he will. He also did miracles because he was sent by the Father. John chapter five verse thirty six and uh, ten verses. Uh, chapter ten verses twenty four and uh, twenty five. Okay, so we see that the miracles and signs he did were not of him being God but uh, because he was sent by the Father and he did it to the empowering power of the Holy Spirit and the indwelling presence of the Father that we read in John chapter 14, verse 10 and 11. And hence the apostles, they recognized this fact because they were with him, they're able to see it, and they attributed the healing works of Christ to the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, we read this in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. And why do they know it for sure? Is because when Jesus sent them out in twos, and also he sent the 70 later on, they went and did mighty miracles. They were no way God, but they knew that they did it to the power of the uh, Holy Spirit. Okay. So in John chapter 20, verses 21 and 22, we read that just before Jesus ascended back, to heaven back to his father he commissioned his disciples saying as the father has sent me i also send you and then he said uh, this to them he breathed on them and said to them receive the holy spirit okay receive the holy uh, spirit now um, we, we know that this was there uh, you know, this was just after he came back from uh, his uh, after he finished the work on the cross so when he breathed on them and received the holy spirit it's basically talking about their born again experience but again we see later on jesus talking about uh, it when he tells them you know wait in uh, jerusalem till you've been endued or till you've been clothed or endowed with power from on high and that is when we see that they were um, baptized in the Holy Spirit and we see that nothing stopped them and they, they, they did mighty uh, miracles that even the shadow was able to heal and deliver people okay so we see that and it's important to note that when Jesus did all of these signs miracles and wonders when he lived on the earth he did it to the empowering power of the Holy Spirit uh, and it was the Holy Spirit that uh, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, enabled him to do all of these miracles. And when he went back to the father, he promised uh, his disciples and all who were with him, all who believed in him, that he would send us the Holy Spirit. And we see the Holy Spirit coming upon the disciples and the others, 120 of them, you know, and empowered them to do miraculous works, which he did. Okay. We'll move on to his days in the flesh. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 to 9. Can somebody read that? Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 and 9, please. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 to 9. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up the prayers and supplication with the women cries and tears, to him who was able to save from death and was heard, because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Thank you. Uh, so here we see, uh, you know, uh, numerous references to his uh, the humanity of Christ in the days of his flesh. So we see that he prayed. Uh, in verse 7, we read that he offered up prayers and supplications. He prayed for people. He prayed for himself. He prayed for the, you know, the, to do the will and the purpose of which, for which he had come. Uh, we also see that he wept uh, in verse 7 with vehement cries and tears. Uh, in verse 8, we read that he revered the Father. Uh, you know, he... Um, he, he honored him, he um, obeyed him, uh, and he gave reverence to the Father in everything that he did. So we read about godly fear, his godly fear in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. And we also see that he was obedient to the Father. He learned obedience. That means he was taught by the Father. And that is why we see Jesus spending the entire night, uh, you know, with the Father, most nights spent with the Father, hearing the Father, talking to the Father. And that's why we see when he gets up in the morning, he, you know, he knows what to do, where to go, um, how to respond to people and how to um, minister to uh, people. And that's why we see that when he goes to the the pool, you know, he heals only one person uh, and not everybody because there's so many sick people. It's basically because he hears what his father asks him to do and he does exactly that. Okay. We also see in verse 8 that he experienced pain and anguish because he suffered. And verse 9, um, you know, having been perfected, that means Jesus had to prove himself qualified. Uh, to, to be the author of our salvation. And how did he have to prove it? He had to live in obedience. He had to align his will to the Father's will. Uh, he, you know, had to take on that cup of suffering, a uh, cup of, uh, drink the cup of sinfulness of the entire mankind. He who knew no sin, had no sin, lived in no sin, had to take on the sins of mankind, which was something that was quite uh, distressing, quite Ang it was a it's a moment of anguish of um, something quite detestable for God to you know to even sin because or to take on sin because he was somebody who was sinless, but he took it on because it was the will of the Father and he died on uh, uh, on in our place and he took upon our sins and became uh, the full sufficient perfect sacrifice, thus reconciling mankind back to God. Okay, so he walked in submission to the Father in his humanity. We also see that um, something that we need to model to be in live in total submission, surrender, uh, obedience to the Father. Um, you know, and First Peter chapter two verse twenty one, the Apostle Peter writes that in his suffering he left us an example that we should follow in his steps. So every time we feel hungry, we feel lonely, we feel deserted, we feel um, uh, pain, we go through anguish, we um, uh, near death experiences, losing our loved ones. We know that we have a God who identifies with us, our mediator, who became one amongst us, one like us, and who understands us, understands our frailties. Um, you know, that's why it says that, you know, um, uh, uh, even though he was tempted, he did not yield to temptation, but he understands our uh, weaknesses. He knows our frailties. He knows our weaknesses. So what a loving, uh, you know, compassionate, merciful God he is. He just didn't come to reveal the Father and die on the cross for our sins and, you know, fulfill the purpose of God. 
but he came uh, you know so that he can identify with us and he knows what each one of us are going through loss pain suffering loneliness you name it uh, he knows it because he's gone through it he identifies with you he understands okay uh, the last one is the man who will judge the world acts chapter 17 verse 30 and 31 can somebody read that please Acts chapter 17 verses 30 and 31. Truly, this times of ignorance, God overlooked but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the, world's, the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance to his all by raising him from dead. Thank you. So here we see that, um, you know, uh, not only was salvation uh, for the whole, entire mankind was promised through uh, the man Jesus Christ God who became man the logos the eternal logos who became man but we also see that the judgment of the world will also be executed by uh, man uh, it's interesting to know that you know um, that we will be judged by someone who actually lived amongst us and walked as one of us, you know, who was part of us, just like each one of us um, being human like us. So he not only came to, um, you know, bring us salvation, but he will also judge us in righteousness because he himself is God. Okay, so this is talking about the humanity of Christ. So today we basically studied the, um, the aspects of his incarnation. We understood uh, we gathered information about the how of incarnation and we also looked at the humanity of Christ. So any questions anyone has? Any comments, anything you all didn't understand? You want me to explain again? All is clear? Okay, if uh, there are no questions, no doubts, I'll request you to please go through, um, uh, thank you, Joy, uh, go through chapter five, very, very important, chapter six as well. In fact, most of these lessons, please read through um, and, um, uh, you know, we'll, um, uh, so that it will help in your understanding. Now, I'm going to give you um, a test because we've kind of finished uh, six lessons. So we, uh, if you noticed, I'm going to give you three tests. One is uh, 30 marks, the other, uh, two are 30 marks, and one is 40. So we basically have 13 chapters. So we'll do... Um, um, four, four chapters or three chapters. We'll do the first three chapters, then we'll do the second three chapters, and then we'll do, or we'll do four chapters each, right? Four. Yeah, we'll do, uh, for the first test, we'll have the first four chapters, then we'll, for the second test, we'll have the second four chapters, and then the last test, which is 40 marks, we'll have the last um, uh, five chapters okay so we'll have a test on the first four chapters would you like to suggest a date please or do you want me to give you a date so can we have it on feb 14th if nobody is saying anything can we have a te first test on feb 14th is that okay? Yeah. yeah, okay. Okay, so first uh, four chapters, the pre-existence of Christ, his equality with the Father and the Spirit, his role in creation and the promise of his uh, coming. I will post it again in the classroom page or the stream page and you all can check on that and um, I'll give you all the instructions for the test and it's not going to be uh, true or false or like objective types. It's going to be question answers. Uh, uh, so something that you have understood and you're going to write um, and I'll give you all the instructions um, 
uh, in when we when you're going to write the test. Okay, is that fine? Feb 14, our first test. Yes, no. Okay. Yes, okay, fine. Yes. Okay, thank you everyone for joining class. Have a good day and a good week ahead. A uh, blessed week ahead. God bless all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Goodbye.